Hey, Calvary, it is great to see you. Uh, now, admittedly, I'm grieving a little bit because I'm not seeing you in person, and I would much prefer that, but uh, I thought it would be best for your health and possibly mine since uh, I'm finishing up my COVID quarantine and uh, want to make sure that we're not putting anyone at risk. So uh, we decided to go ahead and record this so I could speak to you and with you. And as you can see, uh, I'm fine. Uh, COVID has not been harsh to me, uh, other than the fact that I've been quarantined for uh, 10 days and not around anyone, but I haven't even had a fever for over a week, and so I'm celebrating that, and I appreciate your prayers. I appreciate the ice cream. I appreciate the Diet Pepsi. I appreciate the soup. Most of all, I appreciate the fact that I have a team around me that that uh, I can be gone for that time and not be missed because they're doing such a great job, and I appreciate them tremendously. But that said, it is wonderful to be with you uh, this weekend. So I'm going to invite you to take your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of Acts chapter 11. Acts 11 is our text. If you don't have a Bible with you and you're here in the Sweetwater Room, then uh, obviously grab one of those Bibles in the seats around you, turn to page 1093, and you will find Acts chapter 11. Now, if you're watching from home and joining us uh, at a distance, whether bec uh, because you're not ready to be in crowds or because you're sick and you're struggling, uh, we're just glad to have you. And uh, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please let us know. We'd be glad to deliver one to you, mail one to you, get one to you somehow uh, so that you can have the Word of God and read it. And if you're in the room and uh, you don't have a Bible, then take one of those with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Uh, a guy named Robert Burns wrote a poem, and in it, uh, he recorded one of those lines that sticks with us, and you've probably heard it. You might have even said it uh, many times. I know I have. But it's this, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. The best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. Uh, I don't know about you, but we make plans. We make plans, and often those plans fail. They fall apart. They collapse. Or in 2020, they become victims of COVID, as we have all experienced to some uh, level or another. Uh, this year, I've had two international trips that were canceled due to COVID, and many smaller gatherings, trips, experiences that were part of the, the plan that went awry. Uh, many of you had plans for celebrations, graduations, weddings, uh, all those canceled because of COVID. And of course, right now, as we're heading into Thanksgiving, uh, it's going to be a really different season this year with Thanksgiving and celebrations and sickness and who can gather and who can travel and all of that. They've been altered because the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. We make plans, they don't happen the way we want. Maybe the election didn't go as you planned or hoped. Maybe your financial plans are a mess. They're just a disaster. They have not gone as you had expected. Maybe your plans for relationship and family have gone off the rails due to someone else's choices or maybe even your choices. See, we make plans and those plans fail, and God redeems. See, that's what he does. He redeems. Uh, that's what we see happen in the early church. If you've been with us for these past few months, we've been in the book of Acts, and we've been looking at how God started the church and how it just uh, began growing and changing and developing, and, and we see it from the, the moment of Jesus' resurrection. You know, he was crucified for our sins. He was raised from the dead. And, and uh, the disciples gather, and they're excited. And then, of course, he leaves them. He ascends. And, and then Pentecost happens, and the Holy Spirit falls on all who are believers, and thousands are added on day one of the church, and, and everything changes. And the church is growing, and they're learning from the apostles, and they're in Jerusalem. And, and then persecution started happening. The apostles are arrested. They're beaten. They're threatened. And then Stephen, the deacon, is executed, and, and Saul from Tarsus, the, the Pharisee, goes on a tear persecuting the church, imprisoning people, uh, executing people. And then, of course, Saul is converted on the road to Damascus, and, and, uh, but the church is already scattered, and while their plans are a mess, God redeemed greatly. God redeemed. That's what he does. Acts chapter 11 
looking at verse 19 through 26. Follow along with the story. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists. That's the Greek-speaking non-Jews. So they spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And it was in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. Um, the first thing I want you to see in this passage is that the gospel is messy. The gospel is messy. Did, did you catch this? In verse 19, it says that they tried to just kind of keep the gospel for the family, for themselves and their relatives. They, they were only sharing with Jews. They are only taking the gospel message of Jesus Christ as the one and only Savior to people who were of Jewish background. And then some troublemakers from Cyrene and Cyprus started telling other people. They, they, they just couldn't help themselves. They're in the marketplace. They're out and about, and they run into people, and they start having conversations. And they start sharing the good news of Jesus with Gentiles, non-Jews, Greek-speaking non-Jews. And, and those Greek-speaking non-Jews, those Gentiles, believed the gospel. Now, understand, this wasn't the plan for the church. Well, let me rephrase that. It was Jesus' plan for the church. They should have understood that because he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. But it wasn't the plan for the early church. I mean, this is 12 years after Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. This is 12 years after Pentecost where the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they had the power of God living in them. And suddenly, 12 years later, 12 years later is not suddenly, but suddenly the church is no longer just a bunch of Jewish people gathered together. It's not just a Jewish sect. And it's a mess because they have these Gentiles in the church. Can I just tell you that the gospel is messy? The gospel's messy because Jesus changes lives, and therefore the church is messy because it's filled with gospel people. I mean, there are lots of people whose lives are broken, hurting, sinful failures who need hope and forgiveness and love and salvation. And that's where the gospel comes into play. See, that's why the church of Jesus Christ is meant to be a hospital for the hurting and not a resort for the righteous. It's meant to be a place of, of safety and care and recovery for those that are broken. It's not a place for those who feel good about themselves to gather and celebrate their goodness. You see, church isn't a place for good people to gather and celebrate our holiness. The church is a place where redeemed people gather to care for broken people and to celebrate life change. We need to understand that because from the very beginning, the gospel was messy. It wasn't all neat and tidy and uniform. And yet the temptation is always there to become a holy huddle just for us and our families and our friends who are just like us. Let me say that again. I, I grew up in churches, so I know this is true. The church is always tempted to become that holy huddle that is made up of people who are like us, who feel like us, who think like us, who vote like us, who, who live like us, and we just want it for us and ourselves, and, and we've kind of got our acts together, at least we pretend we do. And, and that's what that holy huddle becomes. It's just for us. But that's not the purpose of the gospel. That's not God's plan. In fact, when we make that choice, it's antichrist. It's anti-Jesus, because Jesus wanted to bring the people from all the nations together. He died, and with his blood, he, he redeemed people of every language and tribe and people and nation. That's what he's about. 
You see, the gospel, the message that Jesus died for our sins and was raised from the dead, and and that everyone who calls on his name receives forgiveness and eternal life is for everyone. It's for everyone. It's, It's radically and gloriously messy because it brings us together from all these different tribes and languages and people and ideas and and voting patterns and and socioeconomic groups and racial groups. And it puts us in this body of Christ to be a beautiful, glorious, redemptive mess. So Calvary is a church for messy people. It's a church for messy people who need healing and freedom and redemption and second chances and grace. And it's a church for all those messy people because Calvary is a church filled with messy people, joyfully being redeemed and restored by God's power. I hope you see that. I hope you know that. In fact, I'm just going to tell you, I'm a mess, and I am gloriously being redeemed by God's grace and his mercy and his power, and I rejoice in that. And uh, in fact, you probably ought to look at the person next to you and, and just look at them and go, you're a mess. Go ahead, tell them. You're a mess. But God loves you, and God's redeeming you. That's the whole point of the gospel, and that's why it's so, so messy. So the gospel is messy. That's the first thing we see in this. The second thing that I want you to see in this passage is to be an encourager. Be an encourager. Barnabas was sent from Jerusalem to Antioch when they started hearing about the mess. Barnabas was trusted by the apostles. Now Barnabas, his name literally means encourager. So they sent the encourager from Jerusalem to Antioch to help this new church that was being born, and and he was there to clean up the mess. Now, he wasn't really there to clean up the mess. He was there to supervise the mess. And, And he preached, and he taught, and many people believed. And then, in the midst of this revival happening, in the midst of all these lives being changed, Barnabas went and found Saul. Now, you remember Saul. Saul was the guy who was there approving the execution of Stephen. Saul was the guy who who started persecuting the early church. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Uh, He's locking people up. He got letters to go to Damascus and arrest people. On the way to Damascus, God met him on the road, changed his life radically. As he became a follower of Jesus, he started preaching about Jesus, but, uh, you know, people kind of freaked out, tried to kill him, so he, he kind of hid, and then he went to, uh, you know, Jerusalem to meet the apostles, but everybody was afraid of him, except for Barnabas, who took him to the apostles and, and introduced him to the apostles, and then they sent him away again because people were trying to kill him, and Barnabas went, and, and he looked beyond Saul's past, he, went, he looked beyond Saul's past, and he went to Tarsus, and he found him. He said, come with me and help me in this, this teaching endeavor. Help me with this church. Help me to disciple these people. And he brought him back, and, and he saw Saul's giftings and abilities, and he turned him loose to serve the people of God. See, Barnabas is kind of my hero. Kind of my hero. I mean, think about it. Uh, First time we see Barnabas, he's generous. He's donating property to the the church to help meet the needs of other people. And then the next time we see uh, Barnabas, he's trusting because he took Saul, the, the persecutor, and introduced him to the apostles when everybody else was afraid of him. And then here we see that he's responsible for recruiting the guy who would end up writing half the New Testament and starting churches all over the Roman Empire. The guy that we call the Apostle Paul. That's what Barnabas did. He he was an encourager. He's the model encourager. And today, I just want you to know you can be an encourager too. In fact, I want to challenge you to be an encourager. Uh, In fact, who wants to be an encourager? Go ahead. Who wants to be an encourager? I mean, because your choices are simply this. Be an encourager or be a discourager. That, that's what you're going to end up doing. You're going to really choose one of those two. So how in the world can we be an encourager? What does it mean to be an encourager? Because all of us know what encouragement feels like, but do you know what it means to do it? So there's a couple elements of this encouragement. First one is, is to focus on helping others succeed. See, when you're an encourager, you want to help other people 
accomplish the things that God has for them. You want to help other people become what God called them to be. You know, help them serve Jesus, help them follow Jesus, help them to become that man or woman that God created them to be. And, and so it's not about you. If, if you're selfish, you can't really encourage. That's why the Apostle Paul, who was the recipient of Barnabas' encouragement, said this in Philippians 2. He said, Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but rather with humility of mind consider others more important than yourself. And do not merely look after your interests, but also the interests of others. See, that's encouragement. Focusing on helping others succeed. So you can't really be selfish and be encouraging. And then encouragement means that you see the gifts and abilities in others and you name them and you champion them. That you actually see what other people are capable of. And you begin to nurture that and you speak to that and you call it out and you recognize it. And, and, and this is the opposite of what we as a society are kind of trained to do. Because most of us, if you get really honest, we can see all the faults in other people really clearly. Now, I don't know about you, but I can see my own faults when I look in the mirror. And when I look at others, I can see their faults. I can see their failings. And the temptation is always to name those and to judge people. Just to be the critic on life. But an encourager actually intentionally looks for reasons to praise, looks for reasons to celebrate, looks for reasons to bless others. In other words, you see their gifts and abilities and you call them out and you say, hey, look, I see this in you. Great job. You can do this. See, encouragement is grace being expressed towards others. Now, I know we often think of grace only as forgiveness and mercy, and it definitely has to involve forgiveness and mercy. But when you are encouraging someone else, it is an act of grace toward them. Because it's suddenly not about you. You're not focused on you. You're laying aside your own needs, your own ideas, your own values, and you're, and you're saying, hey, I want to bless you. I want to help you succeed and accomplish. So you're dying to self. Self-denial, that's an act of grace. We can't do that without help. We need Jesus to do that. And then it's blessing other people. It's saying, hey, I see the good in you. And even though we're all failures because of sin, even though we're all worthy of criticism and critique and judgment, I'm not going to give that to you because I didn't get that from Jesus. I'm going to build you up because when God looks at me, he looks at me through Jesus' eyes and he sees me for the redeemed son of God that I am. And so we decide that we're going to look at other people and see that redeemed child of God that they are the sons and daughters of God that are loved by Jesus because he sacrificed himself for them. So exercise that grace and be an encourager because encouragement is so, so powerful. And as I was uh, preparing for the sermon, I was thinking about all the people that have encouraged me in my life. And many of them I've gotten to say thank you to just for being that encouragement. But there's one that, uh, in retrospect, was such an encouragement that I didn't even recognize it at the time. Uh, so I was serving in, uh, as a youth pastor in South Georgia, and the church was a mess. Not really a glorious mess, just a mess mess. And uh, the pastor had left, and we didn't have uh, uh, a regular pastor yet. And, and so the people were taking turns preaching, but I didn't get to preach on Sunday mornings because I wasn't deemed qualified enough to do that uh, it's kind of humorous now. But anyway, so I wasn't, I wasn't a good enough preacher, so I got to preach on occasionally Sunday nights. And I love that. I love to preach. And so it was on a Sunday night, and I preached. And after the sermon, there was a guy who was making a beeline for me. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where you see that somebody wants to talk to you, and they're coming towards you, and they're coming towards you with purpose. And this was a guy that I had clashed with often. He and I were on staff together. He was the business administrator. He was older. He was retired. He was helping the church out because it was in a mess. But he and I had a little bit different vision for how to treat people and, and do some things. And so we had clashed often. And he came up to me, and he, he looked me eye to eye, and he said, Chad, I want to tell you something, but don't take this wrong. Now, I don't know about you, but when someone says don't take this wrong, I usually kind of brace for something unpleasant. But uh, that's not what he had in mind. He looked at me and he said, you have a gift and you should be doing that every single 
week. You know what he said? He was telling me that I should preach, that, that I should be the leader of a church. And he was, you know, didn't want me to take it wrong because he wasn't telling me to get out of the church. He wasn't telling me I should leave. But um, honestly, that was the first time that somebody had said to me, hey, you should be a pastor and not a student pastor. And, and honestly, it was just a few months later that I began the conversation with Calvary about coming here to be pastor of this church. You see, encouragement is powerful. Your words are more powerful than you realize. You might think nobody's listening. You might think nobody cares what you have to say. But I'm just telling you, your words are powerful. So choose to bless and not curse. Choose to be an encourager, not a discourager. So let me ask you a question. Who are you encouraging? Who are you encouraging? Who are you trying to build up to become what God's called them to become? Who are you calling out the gifts and abilities in that uh, is going to make a difference in their life? Because every person in your life is a potential candidate for encouragement. Everyone around you needs some help in succeeding, needs to know that they have gifts and abilities and are championed to live those out. Everyone that's in your life. So who is it that's in your life that might call you their Barnabas? Who are the ones that you right now need to think about going, hey, I need to be an encourager in their life. So let me just rant for a minute. Parents, let me talk to you, especially if you've got kids at home. But whether you got kids at home or not, or whether you got grandkids around you or not, I just want you to, to listen, especially parents with kids at home. Please, please, please encourage your children. Now, encouragement includes discipline and correction and direction. But let me just ask you this. Are you blessing your kids? Or are you cursing your kids? I mean, we all want to bless our kids, and we all bring some curses, but here's the question I really want you to wrestle with. Parents, are you trying to raise good kids or godly kids? Parents, are you setting the bar for your kids to be good kids or godly kids? Do you want them to be what God created them to be, or do you want them to be what you want them to be? See, many parents are trying to raise good kids. They want their kids to stay out of trouble, not do drugs, get good grades, don't get pregnant, be nice people. That's sort of their goal. I want, I want to have good kids. And they succeed. And oftentimes, those are good, active church kids who grow up and then walk away from Jesus. See it happen all the time. I grieve with parents all the time. I pray with parents for their adult children who they raised to be good kids, and now they're heartbroken. And that's because we encourage them to be good. Parents, can I challenge you today to encourage your children to be godly? To be godly. To love Jesus. To make worship and serving a priority. To live an authentic faith following Jesus. Now, this is not easy. Because you have to model it. You have to, to set the tone. You have to set the direction. You have to be the one who encourages it. And that may mean that, that you send your kids to youth camp and on mission trips instead uh, of sports camps and cheer camps. It might mean that uh, you might have to miss out on some of the travel teams and fun times so that you can make worship a priority. But see, you're encouraging your kids to either be good kids or to be godly kids. And the reality is that good kids may not turn out to be godly, but godly kids always turn out to be good. Let me say that again. Good kids may or may not turn out to be godly, but godly kids always turn out to be good. So parents, please encourage your children to love Jesus. And, and it doesn't just stop with parents. Teachers, if, if you're a, a follower of Jesus and you're a teacher, it doesn't matter if it's a public school, private school, you have such a power to encourage children who are made in God's image, who may or may not know him, to understand their worth, their value, their gifts and abilities. You're one of those people that can call those out every single day. Encourage those children that are entrusted to you. If you're an employer, if you're a boss, then encourage your employees, encourage your coworkers. 
Help them to become what God created them to be. Help them to succeed and to thrive. And you say, well, if I help them too much, they'll leave me and go someplace else. That's okay. God will bless you if you do that. And friends, please encourage your friends. Not just to have fun, but to love Jesus, to follow Jesus. Bring them along with you. Encourage them to walk with you in following Christ. You see, words are powerful. Expectations matter. Values are caught by those that you encourage. So who are you encouraging? Who is it that you want to encourage? And since I'm admonishing you to be an encourager, let me share with you Calvary's process of development. Calvary's process of development. What is it that we're doing? Because like Barnabas, we want to find you We want to acknowledge the gifts and abilities that God has given you. We want to recruit you to help, and we want to turn you loose to serve God in your gifts and abilities. You see, see here at Calvary, we don't want you to just help us accomplish God's mission. We want to help you become the men and women that God created you to be. Because when you're living out your gifts and abilities serving Jesus, you're going to be thrilled with life. You're going to find joy and purpose and, and satisfaction that that is missing in so many people's life. Uh, we're, just, we're just honest about that. That's why when, when you meet Jesus, we encourage you to get baptized. Because your baptism doesn't help me one bit, but here's what's true. You being obedient to Jesus is going to help you grow in your faith. But we've got a whole series of kind of steps that we want to encourage you to take as your church. Because we want to help you grow in this journey following Jesus. We want to encourage you. So the first step is intro to Calvary. We want everyone to take intro to Calvary. It's offered the third Saturday of every month. In fact, it was offered, you know, this weekend. But uh, it was offered before the, any of you heard the message. Sorry about that. It'll be offered next weekend too. Usually 3 o'clock on Saturdays is when it's offered. And in that class, you, you learn about Calvary, you learn about our essential beliefs, you learn about who Jesus is and why we follow him and kind of how we make decisions and operate. You learn a little bit about who we are so that you can decide, hey, I want to be a part of this. And then we offer a class called Equip, and that's the first Saturday of every month at 3 o'clock. And, and that's coming up uh, December 5th if you want to sign up for that Equip class. And that's a class about how we serve and why we serve. Uh, You know, uh, if you've been around Calvary at all, you know that we're going to be doing service projects right and left. This weekend's kicking off a a whole other realm of service projects as we're handing out Christmas backpacks and as we're uh, doing angel tree sign-ups and and you can start blessing people that don't have much. And and that's a great thing. We just got finished with Serve Our Schools. We did the Main Street uh, Fright Night thing again with candy and kids. And, And we're just, we're always serving and Equip explains why. And helps you to understand that God's created you and gifted you for a purpose way beyond just taking care of yourself. And then the third step is a class called Ethos. Now, Ethos, we don't offer every month because it's a lot more intensive. Uh, But the next Ethos class is going to be December the 5th, 8 o'clock in the morning, 8 to noon. It's a four-hour class. And we're going to be offering this one over at McCulloch. And I'm going to encourage you to sign up for it because I'm going to be teaching it. You go, well, what is it? What's it about? Ethos is about the core values of Calvary. It's who we are and why we do what we do at a very deep level. And and if you ever want to lead in any capacity in this church, then ethos is required. And uh, and, and we haven't offered one in almost a year because of COVID. And so I'm just going to encourage you, if you're interested in knowing more, if you're interested in getting qualified to be in leadership, you want to find out uh, the heartbeat of Calvary, then sign up for that. We're going to have it at McCulloch Sanctuary, so we've got room for a lot of people. And like I said, I get the privilege of teaching it, so I would love to have you come and be a part of that class on Saturday, uh, December the 5th. Again, that's from 8 to noon at McCulloch. So the gospel is messy business, and we're called to be encouragers like Barnabas. And Calvary is committed to leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you to join us in this mission. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't yet done it, to follow Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. He's the only one who can clean up our mess. Let's pray together. 
Father, we thank you for the life and love that you have given us in Jesus Christ. We thank you that, that he is the encouragement to us because he saw each one of us and valued us and wanted to redeem us from our sins. So we left heaven and he came to this earth and he suffered and died to be our savior. He was raised from the dead to give us life eternal. And we have been adopted into your family simply because we confess that we're sinners and we need you to save us. So Father, open our eyes to how gracious you have been to us. And then open our eyes to see those people around us that are hurting, that are struggling, that are broken, that are doubting, that are fearful. And God, let us speak encouragement and hope into their lives. Let us be like Barnabas and not just speak a few words, but pursue people and name their gifts and abilities and invite them to join us on a mission that has eternal impact. Father, we thank you. We thank you for loving us, for saving us, and for allowing us to be called your children. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.